pray together. God, I thank you that you are God, that you are on your throne, that you are all-knowing and all-powerful, that there's nothing happening to any of us in this moment that catches you off guard. Thank you that you are sovereign, and in your sovereignty, you redeem all things, and you work all things together for good so that when we come in here and we worship you and we put you in your right place, we're reminded that we're small and that 
That gives us courage, it gives us hope, it gives us strength because you are a good God who is full of compassion and mercy. You are faithful, even when we're faithless, you're faithful. So I pray, God, that in these next few minutes, as we worship, as we talk about worship, that our hope would be put in you, that you would be the one we value the most. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was uh, thinking before I came up here of some of the most powerful worship experiences I've had in my life. My first thought was church because I tend to connect worship with church. That's what we do, that's what we just did. We worship, we gather together, we sing songs, that is worship. And yet I would have to say that some of the most powerful worship moments for me weren't necessarily in church. One moment that came to mind a number of years ago, I was at a women's prison speaking for their church service. I stood in the back as the ladies came in to worship. I was talking to one of the volunteers that is there every week and I asked that volunteer why some of the ladies were wearing different colored uniforms because some of them were wearing yellow uniforms, most of them were, but there were probably, I don't know, eight or 10 of the ladies that were wearing these orange uniforms. And so I said, tell me, why are some of them wearing yellow uniforms and some of them wearing orange uniforms? And she said, the ones who are wearing orange uniforms are pregnant. They came into prison expecting a child. They're gonna deliver that baby while they're in prison. That baby will have to be taken care of until they're released by someone outside of prison. I said, well, who takes care of that baby? And, and the lady who I was talking to said, well, usually there's not a father in, in the picture. Sometimes it's difficult for families to do it, so it's just hard to know. And, and when she said there wasn't a father in the picture, she was talking about the baby's father, but as a father, I was thinking about the, the mom's father. And so I said, oh, do the dads, I was thinking, I was thinking of them. I, do the, their dads sometimes? And she said, no, I don't mean their dads, I mean the baby's dad. And, but she said, yeah, both. It, it doesn't happen very often where either of them are in the picture. And I stood back as I watched these daughters of God worship. And they sang a song that I had sung many times before, Good, Good Father. You're a good, good father. That's who you are, that's who you are. And I'm loved by you, that's who I am, that's who I am. And I watched these ladies just sing it with passion, their arms raised as children worshiping a heavenly father. That was worship. It wasn't a sanctuary. It was a prison. Another moment that came to my mind, a number of years ago, I got a phone call. Young couple in the church, expecting a child, they went to the hospital thinking it would be a delivery, but it was a stillborn baby. I get to the hospital, family is already there. I walk in, family surrounding the mom's bed. I go into where the father is in the next room. I'm talking to him, praying with him. And as I'm doing that, I hear the mom and the family around her bed begin to sing. And the song they sing, how great is our God, how great is our God. And they kept singing it and each time it was a little bit more defiant. It wasn't a sanctuary, it was a delivery room where their baby didn't make it. I learned something about worship that night. You know, for me personally, when my daughter, middle daughter Morgan, is now married with a baby, when she was two, she pulled a dresser over and it came on top of her. I went into the room to wake her up from her nap. I saw the dresser down, I lifted it up. I saw that she was not responsive. I scooped her up in my arms. We sped to the hospital. We get to the hospital. They'll only let one parent go back with the child. I, we didn't vote on it. No one asked me. I was left in the hallway. My wife went back with her. I stood in that hospital hallway and understood loneliness in a way that I'd never understood it before. The hospital hall was quiet, it was kind of dark. 
I remember leaning up against the wall, sliding down till I was sitting on the floor. And as I sat there, feeling very much alone and very much out of control, a song came to my mind. It's a song that I don't think I'd sung since I was a kid, but I started singing it in that hospital hallway. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. Mercy, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And I, I experienced God's presence in that hallway by myself as powerfully as I ever had in my life. So worship is something that we do together in the sanctuary at church, but it's more than that. It's not just singing, in fact. It's not just something we do here. It's something we do, in many ways, everywhere. In fact, if we could just step back from this a little bit, I would say worship isn't just something that religious people do. It's something that everybody does. And that's why you can make an argument that there's no atheist because everyone worships. A simple definition of worship that we could work off of, not taking into account faith, not taking into account uh, God would just be worship is my response to what I value the most. And by that definition, everybody's doing it. We all are responding to the things in life that we value the most. Our decisions, our attitudes, the direction we're going, all of that is being determined by who or what we value the most in this life. Everybody worships. Author and intellectual David Foster Wallace, he captures this in his writing, He was an award-winning and best-selling novelist who took his own life in 2008, but before his death, he gave a commencement address, and here's here's what he said to the graduating class. He said, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship, and pretty much anything you worship will eat you alive, he says. And then he goes on to say, if you worship money and things, If they are where you try to find your real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when the time and age starts showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power and you will feel weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to keep that fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. You hear what he's saying? We are all worshipers. Worship is my response to what I value most. And when I value the wrong things, it eats me alive. And this is the story of our world. We're all worshipers. But when we worship the wrong thing, when what we value the most isn't God himself eats us alive. And so in this series, we've been talking through some different spiritual disciplines. And I guess I would make the case that every spiritual discipline is really an act of worship. Like worship is more than just a song. It's more than just singing. So when, when we repent, we're worshiping. When we pray, we're worshiping. When we're studying God's word, we're worshiping. When we're crushing idols, we're worshiping. When we're fasting, we're worshiping. Like all of those disciplines are acts of worship. But we're specifically talking in these next few minutes about, about worship as many of us would think about it, as just praising, thanking, giving God glory for who he is and what he's done. And the way that we can define worship as a spiritual discipline would be my life's response to the greatness of God. My life's response to the greatness of God. When I understand the greatness of God and respond to that, I am, I am worshiping him. And there are a lot of different psalms we could use to talk about worship. The one I kind of landed on was Psalm 63. Psalm 63, I guess I'm drawn to it because it was written during a time when David was not in the palace and he was not in a sanctuary. I guess I'm drawn to it because of those moments in life that are in the prison and in the delivery room and in the hospital hallway. Because when David writes this psalm in Psalm 63, he's in a desert in a cave and life is not fair to him. King Saul is chasing him down and David's having to hide for his life, run for his life. His things are not comfortable. Things feel very much out of his control. David in this passage is not worshiping while he's surrounded by friends. He's worshiping while he's being hunted by enemies. David is not worshiping with a full stomach. He's he's worshiping not knowing where, where his next meal is gonna come from. So I'm drawn to it for that reason. Psalm 63, 
Starting in verse one, you God are my God. Earnestly, I seek you, I thirst for you. My whole body, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. He's in the desert, he's in the cave. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest, as with the richest foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you and your right hand upholds me. And so David here models for us what worship looks like when you're not in the sanctuary, when things aren't going the way that you hoped, when life is hard. And the first way that we can talk about worship is with the word pursuit. Worship is pursuit. You, God, are my God. I earnestly seek you, and I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. And he is speaking of this desire that he has to be close to God. He's speaking of the desire he has for God's presence in his life. And in this desert, his mouth is parched and it's dry, and he says, I long for you, in a dry and weary land where there's no water. We've talked about these different spiritual disciplines, and last week we said that for many of us, we connect spiritual, different, spiritual disciplines to things like performance, and so I check these boxes and go through these motions because I feel a pressure to impress people and meet expectations. And that's why some of you are here worshiping. Or we connect spiritual disciplines to, do you remember punishment? I've, I made a mistake, I've committed a sin, I feel like I gotta punish myself. And so some of you are, you come to church and it's, I mean, it's you punishing yourself. That's how you think of church. Or it's penance, that I have to earn favor with God, that I need to balance out the scales in my life so one day when I stand before him, hopefully the good outweighs the bad. And, and none of that is what the gospel would teach, that Jesus, he paid our price, he took our punishment upon himself that the only thing that makes us right with God is, is his sacrifice, it's not our good deeds. We're not doing these things because we are trying to earn God's favor and love. The Bible says while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the word we used last week to connect to spiritual disciplines is the word pursuit, that we want to pursue God and spiritual disciplines help us pursue him with our whole hearts. And, and David captures that, that when we worship, what we're doing is that we are, we are pursuing him. And so I just wanna give us some ways that we can live this out as we, as we look at this uh, passage in verse two, two and three. David talks about the practice and the posture of worship. He says, I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. And, and he talks to us about this practice, worshiping in the sanctuary, of praising God with our lips. So worship is a song, but it's more than a song. I wanna give you just a few ways that we can practice worship this week as we prepare for Easter. First thing I would say is give God your mornings and your evenings. If you remember nothing else, will you just try this for a week? Give him your mornings and your evenings. This is consistent throughout the Psalms. We see this reflected here in, in this Psalm. David talks about being on his bed at night, the watches of the night. He wakes up, he can't go back to sleep and he worships, it's what he does. He doesn't get on his phone and scroll through it until his eyes get tired, he, he worships. And then in the morning, he, he seeks God. The, the word here in verse one is earnestly, it says, Earnestly, I seek you. That word's an interesting word. If you check some other translations, it doesn't say earnestly. It says early in the morning. There is a, a word here that can be translated as either earnestly or early. I would say it goes together. When you worship God early in the morning, you are demonstrating an earnestness that reflects worship, that this is what matters most to you. This is this is where you're giving your attention. This is what you are making your priority. You start off by giving God your day. So last week, I 
I challenge you to give God the first 24 minutes of your day. On Thursday night, I said that was 1% of your day because they don't teach math in Bible college. <laughs> Thankfully, a lot of you who've never really tried to talk to me before wanted to correct me, and I appreciate that. <laughs> and so I adjusted that Sunday morning, got it right, give God the first 24 minutes of your day as a way to give him a minute of every hour. A minute of every hour. I think that's right. <laughs> the idea is not that it's 24 minutes. It's saying, God, I want you to have the first part of my day. I wanna worship you in the morning. I am telling you, this is biblical and this is powerful. Jesus modeled it early in the morning while it was still dark. He went out and spent time with his father. If Jesus did that, then we should do that. If David did that, then we, we should do that. I remember a man in my growing up years who was the grandfather of a good friend of mine. The grandfather's name was Don DeWelt. Lots of people loved Don. What I remember about him as a kid, I don't mean this disrespectfully, I remember his big ears and big smile. I remember that as a little kid. And there was something about his smile and his countenance that would always make me smile. As a grade school boy, I remember his joy. And as I grew up, I, I began to notice that other people were drawn to him for these same reasons. I found out later in life that Don had a fairly unusual practice. He would wake up every morning, he would shower, shave, put on a suit and tie before he put on his clothes for the day. So he didn't often wear a suit and tie, whether it was in the office or even to church, or if he's out mowing the grass, of course he's not gonna wear a suit and tie. But every morning he would shower, shave, put on a suit and tie because he would have a standing appointment with God every morning and it was his way of expressing this earnestness. In the same way that if you had a, a, a date with someone and you want to look your very best and you wanna be prepared for them, that you, you might go out of your way a little bit because you know that's a special time. He had, he had just decided that he was gonna do that. Now that wasn't something he necessarily did publicly, but in his personal time with God, that's what he did. Every morning, shower, shave, suit and tie, in his closet, spend time with God, suit and tie comes off, puts on his clothes for the day. I love that. I love the priority. I love how he is responding to what he values most. Give God your mornings and your evenings. The second thing I would tell you is every day, write down seven things you're thankful for. If you just do this practice, it will help set your hearts to worship. Seven, seven things you're thankful for. And they don't have to be the, the different things. Some of you are like, seven things every day. They can be the same things. It's fine, you can write down. But you begin your day or during your day, you just write down seven things that you're thankful for. And we see this throughout the Psalms. The Psalm, Psalms are full of these lists of thanksgiving. Another thing I would say is go outside and take a walk. You enjoy God's creation. Make time to sit on the porch and watch the sunset. Psalm 19, two says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, the skies display the work of his hands. Day after day, they speak, and night after night, they make him known. And, and the last thing I would say is remember and celebrate God's power and love. Tell the story of what God has done for you. Tell it to as many people as you can, as often as you can, but certainly tell it to people in your life who you love and who love you, recount God's grace in your life. Remember his goodness and the difference he's made. Verse four, I will praise you as long as I live and in your name, I will lift up my hands. This is one of a number of places in the Psalms where David talks about worship posture. And so there are places where he talks about sitting, standing, kneeling, laying flat on the ground. Here he talks about hands being raised. You see this Old Testament and New Testament. And I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the significance and meaning of hands being raised in worship for this reason, because it teaches us what worship is, meaning that what it represents, not necessarily whether or not you raise your hands in worship, that's not really the point, it's what it represents that teaches us about worship. Because I, I know that you know, some of you didn't grow up with raising hands in worship and you're not comfortable with it and that's fine. 
One of the things I love about this church is that there are lots of different people, lots of different backgrounds. And while we would challenge you to step out of your comfort zone, we would encourage you as a, as a church to be expressive in how you worship. I get it, there are different levels of it. I have um, two sons-in-law uh, who I, I love. And um, this past year, I watched different college basketball games with them. And one of my sons-in-law is a huge Purdue fan. It's where he graduated, went to school. Another one of my fan, uh, sons-in-law is a huge UK fan, okay? So I have one daughter left. Please, God, get it right. But my, <laughs> my, my, uh, my son-in-law, who is a huge Purdue fan, he, he's just very expressive. If we're watching a Purdue game, you know, he never sits down. He stands up the entire game. Doesn't matter how many points Purdue is up, he's still gonna be standing up. He's gonna be yelling at the TV. He'll be exasperated, and when he's exasperated, he'll yell, what are you thinking? And, and then when something good happens, he'll say, let's go. And he doesn't just say, like he screams, you can hear him outside. He'll say, let's go. If it's really good, it'll be, let's go, baby. He's, you know exactly how he feels as he expresses his passion for Purdue. My other son-in-law, UK fan, he likes to play it cool. He's a huge UK fan, but if, if it's not going well, like he won't, he won't let you know it. If you look at him, he might, you know, shake his head a little, give a bit of a sigh. If there's a great play, like they score a bucket to go up, take the lead at the end of the game, and you look at him hoping for a response and he sees that you're looking, he might give you one of these. Like that's, but that's it. Like you're not gonna get much more than that. He's gonna be laying on the couch and he might give you this. Huge fans, by the way, they have no problem talking trash to each other about each other's teams, but how they express their passion is different because they're different. They have different personalities. The point is that when we talk about this expressiveness in worship, like there's an understanding that, that it's, it's different, but we want it to be an outward reflection of something that's happening on the inside. That's the point as we talk about some of this. Um, John Acuff talks about different levels of raising hands in church. And then he suggests what might be best for you and your personality. And I added a few to this, but you know, one, one is he talks about what he calls the ninja. This is the ninja, okay? So some of you might try this, like just take your hands out of your pocket and just do this. Nobody will notice. And if this is how you worship, that's awesome. Like, if you're a ninja, be a ninja. We, we, need, we need some ninjas. Like, it's okay. That's all right. And then there's what I, I would call a mama's helper. This is mama's helper. It, when I was a kid, my mom would ask me to carry something, like firewood, groceries, watermelon, whatever. And she would say, go like this. I'd go like this. And she, she'd put a bunch of stuff in my hands. Mama's helper. Some of you are ninjas. And it's mama. Just try mama's helper. Just try it. Go from ninja to mama's helper. Uh, there, there are other people who um, are the double high fives. Like that's who you are. Double high, if you were at a ball game and something great happened, you'd double high five. You wouldn't just high five. You'd double high five the person next to you. That's how you roll. And we need some double high fives. In fact, we need some double high fives next to ninjas. If, if you were all double high fives, it would cause problems in the rows and aisles. Like we wanna match up as much as we can. We wanna match up the double high fives with the ninjas and every once in a while throw in a, a, a mama's helper. There, there are lots of different ways. There's, my favorite is the escalator. Like that's my go-to. One hand up and the other hand in my pocket. Like that's... One hand saying, I give glory to God. The other hand says, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. And the key to the good elevator is it's not the same time. It's not that you don't, you don't, it's this one and then this one. It's just one's up, one's down and a lot of different ways. But I wanna to talk to you about why this is important and what it teaches us about worship. When we have our hands raised in worship, the Bible teaches us that it, it's symbolic, it's significant of what we're communicating to God. First, that we are communicating surrender. It's the universal sign for surrender. Now, we've all seen this in a movie or TV show. A police officer will say, you're surrounded, come out, come out with your hands up, right? It's, it's this, you can't run anymore. There's no more hiding, no more making excuses. I am surrendering. And when we worship, we are actively surrendering to God. When we worship, we are saying, God, you are what I value most, not not me, but you. And, and when we worship and raise our hands in worship, we are saying dependent 
or expressing dependence. If you go to the nursery and you watch the children, that's what they'll do. Young kids run up to their parents, hands raised. They need something. They need attention. They need some food, snack. They're hungry, they're tired, they wanna be held. Hands raised in, in worship is saying, God, I am dependent on you. Hands raised is a sign of receiving. If I told you I have a gift for you and you see me with a package, then you'd put your hands out to receive the package. When, when we worship, whether or not you raise your hands is not the point. You are taking a posture of, of receiving from God, compassion, mercy, grace. We're offering him praise, but as we do, we are experiencing his, his loving kindness as we see throughout the Psalms. And, and then raising hands in worship is most commonly used to express honor. It's, it's lifting up God. We see this throughout the Psalms. It's glorifying him. In the New Testament, the Old Testament, hands raised would have been more like this, but it was, it was a way of showing that your hands were clean. Before entering the tabernacle, you'd go through these ceremonies, these cleansing ceremonies, clean hands. And so in the New Testament, in 1 Timothy, Paul says, I want men everywhere to lift up clean hands, to lift up holy hands. It's this idea that my hands are clean, not because of my good deeds or my righteousness, but because of God's grace in my life. And then hands raised are a sign of agreement. If I asked, you know, how many of you had breakfast this morning, you'd, a lot of you would raise your hand as a way to say, yeah, that's true of me, that's true of me. And so when we worship, that's what we're doing. We're saying, what I'm singing here is my identity. It's true, it's true of me. I align myself with this. And then as David ends this psalm, he says, I will be fully satisfied as with the riches of foods, with, the singing, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you throughout the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you and your right hand upholds me. And he talks about the power of worship. When we worship, we are giving to God. But when you worship, you are changed. A lot of you understand it. Like you come in here and even you experienced it a few moments ago. You didn't really feel like being here. Long day at work, you come in and you start worshiping, but what happens as you worship? Then your soul starts to be satisfied. You begin to have your perspective change. As David says, your love is better than life. You start to find rest and peace. Hope is renewed you begin to find that security and strength. David says, I cling to you and you uphold me. It changes you. As a pastor, one of my favorite things is watching people go from this to this. I love it. I see it in church. Somebody will come in, I haven't seen it before, usually sitting in this section, I can see y'all. And, and They'll be like this, arms crossed. And they stand up during worship, but they do it reluctantly. It's like, really? I've been standing all day. We're gonna stand? All right, I'll stand. But they're kind of the last one up. Hands in the pocket during worship. And then at some point, not always, but sometimes, I look out and I see that same guy doing this. And, and that's the invitation, to go from this to this. This means pride, apathy. This means surrender, dependence, honor. Uh, Dave Kennedy was a pastor on our staff for a long time before he went to be with Jesus. Somebody I looked up to he told uh, a story about this lady that was in his church. Every Sunday after church, she would go to the nursing home to see her dad. She'd take her husband and two kids and they'd go to the nursing home to see her father. And they did it every Sunday, never missed. And, and every Sunday they'd go out there, her dad would be waiting for them in the courtyard out front of the nursing home. 
But as time went on, her father's health declined and his, his cognitive abilities declined. And it got to the point where he had a hard time remembering the kids' names. And it got to the point where he couldn't find his way back to his room, had to be walked back to his room because he couldn't remember which one was his. But he was always out there on Sunday to meet them. And one day, his daughter just didn't quite understand how that worked, how he would always remember to come out and meet them on Sundays, but couldn't remember the kids' names, couldn't quite remember where his room was. And so his daughter asked him on one Sunday, she said, Daddy, do you, do you know what day of the week it is? And he thought about it. He said, no, I, I don't know. And, and she said, well, how did you know to come out and wait for us today if you didn't know today was Sunday? And he said, oh, I wait for you every day. And this is the heart of your heavenly father. Listen, he loves that you're here today. He loves that you've come to worship him. He's thrilled. But he waits for you every day. He wants more than this. In the mornings, he gives you breath and life and he makes the sun shine and he waits for worship to be noticed, acknowledged, to be glorified. At night, as you lay in your bed and you feel the stress and anxiety of the day and it feels crushing to you, he waits and he hopes you'll share it with him. He wants, he wants you to talk to him about it. And, and when you sit down for a meal that he's provided for you to eat, he waits to see if you'll say thank you. He loves you. He loves you so much. He wants to be close to you. And if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. And so when we worship, we're meeting with God. We're glorifying him and honoring him. We're being reminded of who he is and, and who we are and the difference that makes. So we wanna do that together for the next few minutes. I wanna just worship him with our whole hearts. Let me pray for us and then we'll worship together. God, I pray that you would be who we value most. All of us are worshipers. We all value something. When we worship the wrong thing, it eats us alive. But when we worship you, we begin to discover this is what we were made for. This is what our soul was created for. And so I pray, God, in these next few minutes, even as we worship, that that would come alive within us. And then when we leave here, God, we, we wouldn't um, think of worship as something that we did but something that we continue to do, that we don't just come to church to worship, we come worshiping to church, we, we leave church worshiping. And so I pray, God, that this would um, just reflect in every area of our lives. God, I know for some people in this room, you've been waiting, you've been waiting a long time, and you love them so much. And what you want more than anything is for them to turn to you to draw near to you. You want them more than anything to stop trying to find this satisfaction in life and all these other areas and to turn to you. I pray that would happen as we worship you together. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
We join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of faith. And with one voice, a thousand years.